Don, I have about 5,000 questions, so I'm glad that you came in. I've uh, been a fan for a long time, like just of your individual story, and then obviously your um, the group story of you with the Eagles, and then post as well. It's like three different versions. Do you feel like you've lived three different careers? Because I feel like, because Eddie and I were talking about it earlier, we feel like it's like three different versions of an artist. Do you feel that way about yourself? I do. It's actually, you know, growing up in Gainesville and being in in an environment that musically doesn't exist. I mean, they had a white radio station that would only play white artists on the radio station growing up. But at night, I could dial in WLAC in Nashville, Tennessee, and I could hear Little Richard screaming, Tutti Fruity, and I could hear B.B. King, and I could hear Albert King. So I'd just be glued to that radio. And uh, they had a thing called Randy's Record Mart. I don't know if anybody even remembers that. If you heard something on that radio station that you liked, you could put a dollar or two dollars, I think it was, in an envelope with your return address, and you could mail it to Randy's Record Mart. Then every day you'd start checking the mailbox. This is like the way you used to download back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> like super slow Wi-Fi. And uh, finally the record would come, the 45 by B.B. King, and I'd put it on a turntable and record it on a, a reel-to-reel tape recorder. It's seven and a half inches per second. And then I'd, once it was recorded, I'd slow it down to three and three quarters so I could hear the motion. So you could hear the notes like uh, and, how, and, and the style that they're playing? Yeah, but it's an octave down. But you can hear the notes as he's going through it. You figure that out, and then you can put it back up to speed and try to get your chops up to play it at the same speed he did. So, you know, I got a call the other day, well, about a year ago, from the CEO of Gibson Company. And he was at a NAMM show down in Dallas. And he says, Don, you got to hear this guy play Hotel California solo. I was like, oh, really? Do I, <laughs> <laughs> I got to hear it again? I said, okay, put him on. So this person starts playing, and it's just amazing. He's got it note for note, vibratos in the right place, the tempos, the harmonies, the whole ending solo is amazing. I said, who is that? And he said, it's a 10-year-old boy. I went, no kidding. So I said, put him on the phone. I had him uh, tell me how he learned that. How did you learn that? I didn't even have a guitar until I was 10. This guy's ripping through hotel. He said, I got an iPad, and I went on and watched you playing live, and I watched your fingers until I could speed it up to where I could play with it. He did your version of that just with today's technology. That's right. Exactly right. But back then, that was the only way to learn. We didn't even have a music store in Gainesville when we grew up. So the only way you could learn is by your ear. So Chris Stapleton's a decent friend of mine, and I, his song gets covered all the time. A lot of his songs do, but like Tennessee Whiskey, which is not his song, but one that he covered and made it re-popular re again, gets covered all the time. Are people constantly wanting you to hear covers of your songs? <laughs> like, <laughs> Don, listen to this. Does that happen a lot where it's like, listen to this play or, or not so much anymore? It, it happens a lot just if I'm going through Instagram or Facebook or something. There's all the, or TikTok, there's people that want to show me that I, they can play my solo, which is really flattering. You know, it's not an easy solo by any stretch of the imagination. and But it is flattering to, for that many people to try to attempt. There's a, Actually, I saw a trombone player mm. doing the solo for Hotel California on trombone. It's like, this guy is a great player, but I can't imagine a sewer pipe player who makes <laughs> playing rrr, 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 doing the hotel, so I watched it. Did you write about, like, when you wrote that, like, we're on the beach, like, what? Where did that come to you? Like th th that, because it wasn't written as part of the whole song, right? Didn't you write the intro to that song just kind of by itself? What happened was I had rented a house on a beach in Malibu. I had two little kids. One was about a year old and one was like two and a half. And um, I was sitting on the couch. It was just a beautiful, sunny California day. And the sun was glistening on the surf as it's coming in. And my kids were in the sand on the swing set. And so I have this guitar, acoustic guitar, and I'm just sitting there, and I start playing this chord progression. And about three or four times through the progression, I said, I, I have to go in the back bedroom and record a little bit of it, because if I don't record it, tomorrow I'll go, what was that thing that was so... So I run in the back bedroom, record about, I don't know, two or three times through the verse progression, and uh, just put it away. Um, it was actually my one-year-old daughter's bedroom was my recording studio <laughs> back then. When she was awake playing, I could go in and write demos and stuff. Anyway, so um, 
I recorded that, and then we started writing song ideas for the album that was untitled at the time that was going to be Hotel California. So I wound up writing 16 or 17 complete basic tracks where I would go in and take an idea like that little progression, and I'd fill it out and write a chorus part to it, and I'd play bass on it, and I had a little rhythm rhythm drum machine called a rhythm ace that you used to see on piano players in bars that they could set it to a cha-cha or set it to a rock beat. So I used that, and then I just overdubbed a bunch of stuff on this little four-track tape recorder, three to one, then fill up two more tracks and bounce those three to one. And so it was mono at the time. As a matter of fact, I just I should have brought my laptop because I have a, a digital copy of it. I could play you a little bit of it. And it sounds, I play the beginning with a 12 string and then these electrics come in. The solo at the very end is pretty much like it is on the record with the exception, exception of some Walsh-isms. When Joe and I play together, we came up with just great, unique stuff. So uh, I put that idea on a cassette with like 15 or 16 other song ideas. One became Victim of Love, and Henley liked that one that sounded like a Mexican reggae. And so he was off and running, writing lyrics to that song and came up with the lyric idea and lyrics for Hotel California, which was on top of that music bed. So... That's kind of how that all came together. And I didn't want to geek out. I read your book as soon as it came out. Like, the week it came out, I devoured it. Like, I'm a blood roll fan. I knew the story about the beach. I was like, I don't know. I think it's a beach. <laughs> but I knew because I, it, it, as soon as that book came out, I, I crushed it. And it's really one of my favorite, like, music bio books ever. And I think it represents, again, what we're just talking about back in your childhood, like Gainesville, Florida. What was your environment? What were you surrounded by musically in Gainesville that even created an interest to want to hear music that wasn't the typical white music that you got there? Like, where, where was that coming from? Like, that desire to learn and be around different kinds of music? There was nothing else to do. There was no internet. Uh, television had three channels. You know, it was ABC, NBC, CBS, and then they went off the air shortly after sunset. They used to so play the Star Spangled Banner National Anthem. I was telling one of our people here, like, I caught the tail end of that in my life, and they were like, what, the channel would go off? I was like, yeah. And then it would show the screen of his hold, yeah. yeah. And there was no really individual entertainment you could do. So I wound up getting a guitar and just trying to figure out how it worked. And How'd you get the guitar? Where did that? There was a kid that lived across the street from me. And up in the top of one of his closets, I saw an acoustic guitar. And it had some broken strings on it. And my brother and I had just come back down from South Carolina. And my favorite uncle had given us a box of cherry bombs. And we hid them in the trunk from my dad. Because <laughs> my dad wouldn't let us play with those things. So when it would rain, we lived on a dirt road that was crowned. And there was a ditch on both sides of the road for all the Florida runoff. And to get from the road to your house, there was a big metal culvert that the water would run through underneath your driveway. So when it was raining and we would run out with these cherry bombs, light them and throw them upstream and tie them so they would float down into that culvert and then boom, boom blow up and everybody would come running out to see what was going on and we would be back in the house hiding. So this kid comes out, he sees us doing it and he says, I want some of those cherry bombs. I said, well, I'll give you a handful of these cherry bombs if you can get me that guitar that you have. We'll make a trade. So he runs back to his house, gets his guitar, brings it over, I give him the cherry bombs. Fifteen minutes later, cherry bombs are gone, but I got a guitar. <laughs> we didn't have any money. That was the only way we could get started. Did, Did you have an intro, or was it um, like a natural knack with learning music or hearing music and being able to find the notes? And also, you have to learn how to tune a guitar, which is difficult. Like, how did that education happen with you? Well, once I had a guitar, I didn't even know how to begin, where to begin. So there was a guy that lived about two or three blocks around the corner from me uh, that I'd ride by his house on my bike, and I'd see him sitting on his porch playing guitar. So I went over to his house one day with that guitar, and it was missing two or three strings. And uh, he said, well, you got to get some strings for this. I said, well, where do I get strings? He says, you got to go up to the drugstore. There was no music store, so the drugstore had these black diamond guitar strings, and you could buy one, two, or I had to buy three. So I had to get enough money mowing lawns and washing my brother's car and stuff to be able to go up and buy some strings. I took the strings and the guitar over to this guy's house. He showed me how to string the guitar, 
and showed me how to tune it. And then he taught me this song called Red River Valley, which is like a real old-fashioned country song. And I was off and running. I had three chords, C, F, and G. And that's all I needed. Learning F? That's a hard, that's a hard first. <laughs> well, I was C, D, G. <laughs> yeah, there was no F until later. <laughs> no, I cheated with the four-string F, not the full bar Got chord it. or anything. Yeah. So you do you start playing in Gainesville for your friends? Like, when was the first time you played and got paid? I think shortly after I got, I got a year or two. I must have been about fourteen or something. And uh, I think a year or two into those early acoustics, my dad found a a family who had bought a guitar, a Fender guitar, and a little tweed amp for uh, the girl, and she complained because she had to cut her nails and it hurt her fingers because it just lived underneath their bed. And so he bought it from this family and brought it home the one day for me, and I was like, my God, this is amazing. And I was imitating everybody, Buddy Holly, Elvis Presley, anybody I could get my hands on to learn their records and play electric guitar. And then I met this guy named Stephen Stills who would – left somewhere in Florida, there was a military academy, like a military school, a high school, who had run away from high school. And, and this is way before he was Stephen Stills. Like yeah. you just met, that just as a civilian, regular guy, you meet Stephen Stills. Yeah. Okay. He and I and Tom Petty and Bernie Ledden all went to the same high school. So when we were, before we got to high school, uh, he was in Gainesville and he played in this band with me called the Continentals which a Continental kit back then was, like, really cool, you know. So um, Anyway, so we started playing but teen time dances. We wouldn't, really didn't get paid. It was just for the fun of being on the stage in a PA and playing and having a good time. Um, but I think the first time we got played, Stephen, paid, Stephen and I got in a car, and my mom drove us to this little women's organization tea party where they have those little finger sandwiches and drink tea and stuff. And Stephen and I would just play acoustic guitar for these women. I think we got... Ten dollars or something. We made five bucks a piece, you know. Uh, and from there, it really wasn't ever about the money. To tell you the truth, it was just the love of playing and figuring out music and how does this work and how do you write songs and how do you, you know, I would get Mel Bay guitar books and learn chords from Mel Bay and just kind of self-educated all the way along. At what point? Because you're talking about three absolute Hall of Famers, not even just like traditional sense rock and roll Hall of Fame, but like the greatest to ever do anything musically with Stephen Stills and Tom Petty and yourself. Do you guys all know you want to do it solo? Why'd you break up the band? Like, like that feels like a pretty solid band on. <laughs> well, Stephen left. Uh, as soon as he graduated from high school, he was one year ahead of me. He left and moved to California. And I didn't see him until quite a few years later. I think he graduated in 64. Was it to do music, though, when he left? Was he like, I'm going to go do music? Or was he just moving to California to see what happened no, with life? No, he, he knew that was his yeah. destiny. He got out to California. It wasn't happening in the southeast. It wasn't happening in New York. Uh, it was happening in California. So he was magnificently drawn out to uh, California. And the next time I heard him was I was laying in bed one night and the radio was on and I heard for what it's worth. And I went, God, that voice sounds really familiar. I know, the, who is that? And they said it was Buffalo Springfield. And I went and figured out who Buffalo Springfield was, was really Stephen. And then the next time I actually saw him physically, he was on stage at Woodstock. And I was in the crowd and I went, that's Stephen still on stage at Woodstock. So you were there watching. Yeah. And you see your friend on stage, 1969, Woodstock. That's right. That's crazy. Yeah. Was Woodstock for you as a fan? Was it as like wild and muddy and everything that we see? Or did you get the good version of it? I, I, I had enough foresight to actually have gone to Woodstock with a guy who owned what it's called now a travel all. It's like the predecessor to a suburban. It had box doors on the back that open. So we put a mattress in the back because it's out just in the middle of nowhere, right? And we brought an ice chest with drinks and food and we were got there a day early and we backed in so we could open those doors towards the stage. Even if it was pouring rain, we had shelter, we were dry, yeah. a comfy place to sleep, food with it. And then uh, it was just great because I saw some of the most important I think, influential musicians in the history of rock. I saw Jimi Hendrix. I saw Carlos Santana. 
So Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Grateful Dead, just on and on. Janis Joplin for three solid days. It was probably the best music event that ever exploded on the planet. It just resonated all over the world. And as a matter of fact, I wrote a song about it on my last record about how that event went on to influence decades after decades after decades of young people that love rock and roll and wanted to learn to play like that little 10-year-old in Texas and became famous decade after decade after decade. It's called American Rock and Roll. That's the title of my last album. And that song is about being at Woodstock and seeing the beginning of it. When you were at Woodstock and you're watching these great artists and you're inspired, but you were in the midst of the early part of your music career at the same time, did you have a a healthy professional jealousy or would you have been like me and been like, I should be up there, this sucks. <laughs> I would say both. It was dependent on how much I was smoking at the time. If uh, I was smoking, I was pretty mellow about it. I thought <laughs> I should be up there. <laughs> See, I think I would have been completely jealous the whole time, but that's really cool that like you t turned out to be really one of America's great musicians, but you were also there as a fan probably at what was our greatest music event. Yeah. Because you have that perspective of being a fan and watching it as well. Yeah. Man, I just think about how muddy it was, and he was in a freaking Suburban. Yeah. <laughs> he was covered. <laughs> like, like he, he was ahead. Yeah, Don, so, we, you know, I always hear about the California sound back then. You talked about that a little bit, and everyone was going to California to, to make music. But in the 60s, you know, you think about California as Beach Boys. The, the Beach Boys had the California sound. In the 70s, you guys had the California sound. Did you ever think about that? Well, yeah, because there was nobody except for Bernie Ledden that was in the Eagles that was from California. Don Henley was from Texas. I was from Florida. Joe Walsh later joined. I think he was from Detroit or something. No, Glenn was from Detroit. There was nobody in the band that had the California sound. But we somehow managed to be given the title of the new California sound in, in the 70s, yeah. And you embraced it? You felt like... Even though, you know, not really a band full of Californians. <laughs> like, would you guys, were, the, were California sound? I mean, well, we were making music in California. Sure. You know, so uh, I do have to say that when the band first, even before I joined it, Bernie Ledden was a brilliantly gifted country musician. He played unbelievable flat top guitar, the best, one of the best five string banjo players I've ever seen in my life. He played pedal steel. He played uh, mandolin. He was just, he loved country music. You listen to those first couple of early records, that's a really heavy influence coming from Bernie and all of those tracks, right? So there was a the birth of what I thought was early country rock music in those tracks. Later, when I joined the band, everybody wanted to move, except for Bernie, wanted to move from country rock to more midstream AM rock and roll radio. And uh, so that's why I was brought in to kind of put a harder edge on everything that led it out of country. How was it joining a group that was already a group? What's that dynamic like? Well, it was interesting because Bernie and I had been friends since high school. We had Bernie replaced Stephen Stills in the Monty Quintet when Steve took off. And uh, so I had known him for a long time, and he had given me insights into the dynamics in that band uh, in quite extensive ways. About It always felt like a band that was about to break up. So I had no idea how long. If I join this band, two weeks from now, somebody's going to quit and take off. And Bernie eventually did quit uh, during the one of these nights records. So. Did you feel like that helped the creative process at all, or at least made it a like, like a quirky creative process that there was always some sort of tension? Like, was that, I, were you challenging each other creatively because there was tension? Or was it just like, this kind of, it's, it's just tough? I, I think both. I think there were egos involved. I think there were song choices involved. Uh, I think there was a, a battle for who was going to be the front man which was really Glenn Fry originally started being the front man from the get-go. All the songs on the first record were, were Glenn Fry songs, big hits. And then Don Henley just kind of roared out of the background, off the drums, into singing spectacular songs like Witchy Woman and Best of My Love and just a 
great, great songs. His voice was spectacular. So there was always that struggle between those two guys, even though they were writing and collaborating together. I was there not to create friction, but to help divert whatever their goal was musically, directly, because Don Henley doesn't write music. And Glenn... He used to call himself the claw when he played piano. It was like he he could get through it, but he really wasn't a pianist. And so uh, between Bernie's influence and earlier on, and then when he finally left, and he left for what I thought was a really good reason, to tell you the truth. He really wanted to retain the roots of country in some part of these records. And they were just we're over country, we're going to move into rock and and pop and all this other stuff. And when Bernie left, they chose to get Joe in, which I love Joe to death. I think he and I had some of the best times together of any time on the road. Uh, And not only that, but the fun, we had already been playing together uh, and TV shows and shows that we opened for Elton John at Dodger Stadium as Joe Walsh and Friends. And so he and I had already been doing that stuff. So when that idea for Hotel California came up in that little beach house, I said, I ought to make an ending on this that Joe and I could play on so that we could have. So I played a solo kind of like what I was going to play. And then I'd play something I thought Joe would try to sound like Joe. And I was like simulating that, that thing at the very end of the record. It was just always so much fun to work and play with him. And we inspired each other. It was like, Okay, you think you can do this? Try this, you know. And okay, try, let's put a squeak on this one, and you know, just try to. That was a very loving, fun, creative process. A lot of times, it was over lyrics, and Don Henley is a brilliant lyricist, in my opinion. He just, you take a song like Hotel, and each little line is like a postcard. It's like a picture of the song on a dark desert highway. You see it, cool in my hair. You can feel it in your hair. The warm smell, you can smell Kalidas. He just has a way to draw these little pictures that lead you to a, a great chorus. Brilliant. He's an English literature major, major, and it shows in his writing. So I have the utmost respect for Don and his skills that way. His voice, I used to say he could sing the New York Times telephone book, <laughs> and I'd uh, love it. I'll buy it platinum, you know. <laughs> When did you start to get like free guitars? When do they like recognize you as being <laughs> awesome and they're like, we're sending them free stuff? Was it before the Eagles? Was it with the Eagles? Because now if you're an artist and you're halfway decent, I mean, I get free guitars sent to me and I'm just, an, we're in a comedy duo. <laughs> when did that happen where you started to get like free guitars all the time? Well, I, I really don't accept a lot of stuff that people give me because they want, the brand, my name, sure. on their product. So unless I really use the product, like Gibson Guitars, I was just over at the shop yesterday and hanging out with uh, Cesar and uh, uh, talking about a few, we're doing a tour next uh, 2025, and I, I like to have new-looking guitars that just have these monster flames so that guitar players can go, wow, look at that flame on that guitar. It's like flame envy, you know? It's like, you want these guys to just drool over their guitar. So I'm going to get a couple of new uh, things from them, but I I never really accept stuff that I don't actually use. Did they do, like, endorsement deals back in, like, the 60s and 70s with for instruments? Would they pay you to, even though you loved it? I just don't know when that, ha- when that culture started. I know the 80s it started happening a little bit. But, like, did you just find your guitar, pay for it, and you just travel with it the whole time? That's that was it. just it. There was a guy down in Texas named Tony Dukes. This is early 70s, 73, 74. And whatever town we were playing in, whether it was Dallas or Houston or Austin, he would show up with a Suburban full of classic guitars. Old 59 Les Pauls, 52 Telecasters, 57 Strats, Gretches, Elvis Presley acoustic guitars, and just, uh, and I'd buy everything he got. And so he came in one day and he had this 59 Les Paul, which is my number one Les Paul now, and he wanted $1,200 for it. And I went, Jesus, 1200 bucks? Are you kidding me? That's a lot of money. So I bought it anyway, and I took it back to the sound check. I was going to play it that night in the show. Took it back to the sound check, and Glenn, I opened the cage, and Glenn went, wow, that's really great. Where did you get that? I said, from Tony Dukes. He said, what would you pay for it? I went, $1,200. He went, 
cheap. <laughs> it's like you're an idiot to pay that much for it. Now it's probably worth well over a couple million dollars just yeah. because it's been so documented. And I think Gibson put out a Don Felder Hotel Cala version copy of it. They did 300 and put it out and sold them. They sold like three days. They were all gone. Do you still have the original? I do, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. What's is that your number? What's your number one play guitar? That's like, this is the one. Is it that one? But I don't know. I wouldn't travel with that one. That must cost, that's too valuable. Like, yeah. do you have an A-plus guitar that's like, if I'm playing shows, this is my comfortable mm-hmm. guitar. I like it. This is it. Gives you the tone you want. Uh, it's funny because I was in my studio just cleaning up the other day, and I keep finding these Les Paul cases, and I opened up, and there's a 94 flame top. And I go, oh, I didn't know I had that one. And the next thing I know, I have seven Sunburst Les Pauls, all in the 90s and early 2000s and you can literally pick them up and and they're almost identical that's the good thing about gibson is they're very just consistent from guitar to guitar guitar and the tones of them are are fantastic so i when we do shows i have five different sets of gear that leapfrog and get shipped out to different cities that we're going to when we tour we carry it all on a semi but when we do one-off stuff, like we do a fair and a festival here and a private here up in Montauk, and we're down in Atlanta two days later, you have to use, you know, your your guitars and stuff and pedals, but you use a lot of backline stuff for drums and keyboards and bass amps and stuff. So I have gone through and picked out what I think are the five, my favorite five mm. Les Pauls, and put them in each one of those rigs. Were all the tones because I'm obsessed with guitar tone and trying to find the exact guitar tone, and sometimes it's a tone you can never actually find. It's a, it's the, the perfect tone doesn't exist for certain things, but you get as close as you can to it. But I, so I'm obsessed with, with tone, and I was looking at just some of the songs that you had written and just some of the really famous guitar parts and licks. And, and I'll ask about the song, and I wonder, was it the original tone that you, or did it change as you were recording? For example, One of These Nights. Right? Did, so, is that the original tone that you had in mind for that song? And, yeah. And did you mostly stay with the same tone that yeah. you would bring it? Because really, that was your thing. And you yeah. Got it. The, the thing about one of these nights is funny is because I w- was a really huge fan of Dave Sanborn. I don't know if you know, alto sax player, just a fabulous jazz player. And he and I used to go fishing together when he lived out in Malibu. I'd take him out. We'd go fishing and hang out and so when it came time to write a solo for that, I thought of Dave Sambor. What would Dave Sambor play? It's a sax solo. It's really what it is. And I played uh, one of my first bands in New York City was a jazz rock fusion band. And we had a guy that plays soprano sax. And his phrasing, when you're playing a horn, you have to... You have to take a break and put a pause in your phrasing where, like, guys that shred, they just, you know, they just shred. Don't need to breathe through your hands. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I learned to be musically trained from hearing horn players play. I loved Miles Davis. I drove from Gainesville, Florida to New York City so I could see Miles Davis play live with Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, Wayne Shorter, and Tony Williams. And it was an amazing life-changing experience just like seeing um you know woodstock and seeing those guys there it was like another level of of uh, respect he came out this band's going he's got his back to the audience right and he stands there and the crowd's just waiting for the first notes to come out of his horn and he goes Ba, ba. Three notes. <gasps> <laughs> it's phrasing. Kenny G could go play a thousand notes and not have that response, you know? Take it to the limit. So was there ever an acoustic that turned electric or an electric that turned acoustic from when you wrote it? Or did it always stay with how uh, demoitis would be an example of what happens now right guys will write a song they write it acoustic it's like man we don't want to change it because we're so in love with the demo did that ever happen because that song feels like to me it could be done multiple it could be electric it could be acoustic uh talk to me about that song a little bit 
Well, I didn't write Take It to the Limit. Randy, None of the guitar part? Oh, well, the guitar yeah, parts. I'm yeah, I'm talking about the guitar parts. Okay, okay. I'm okay. only talking about tone. <laughs> like I said, I'm obsessed with tone. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, Randy wrote that, and he came in with an acoustic guitar on it, and I think Glenn wound up playing piano on it, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I, I picked up a Strat thinking, you know, you can use a Strat without it being a biting, sustainy thing and kind of a clear sound to it. And made up those little guitar parts that are the intro and the solo and stuff that's in that. But Randy really, that was his baby. And to hear him sing every night, we, we did a tour and Roy Orbison opened for us. Oh, that's cool. And you could be backstage and he would sing crying and hit that high note at the end of crying. You go, okay, we're on in seven minutes. Like clockwork, every night the crowd would like, wow, just roar when he hit that high note. So when Randy came out with Take It to the Limit, sorry, but we did kind of steal that, that lick from Rory, uh, and it worked every night. Every night that his voice was in good shape, he could sing that high note, and the whole place would just explode. What was Roy, Roy Orbison like? like? I'm sorry? What was he like, Roy Orbison? My grandmother was such a huge fan of Roy, so we listened to him a lot growing up. And also, like, the glasses, too. But, like, uh, how long was he with you guys opening up? Did you have any sort of relationship with him? Yeah, I mean, he was there on the show every night. You'd hug out and talk and sure. stuff. As a matter of fact, his son lives right down the street from my daughter now that they grew up together, you know, and are, are friends to this day. And Roy was a really sweet kind of kind person. No ego, ego uh, no attitude, no rock star stuff, just a really good soul. And uh, he made it comfortable and easy to have a relationship with. So American Rock and Roll, uh, it, was, it was the first new record in seven years, but it's also now been five years. So what, So we're waiting. I mean, it's about, it's a cycle now. Like, is there another, what, what are we doing here? Anything well, new? Uh, I'm, <clears throat> I've got 10 tracks finished and mastered. I'm probably going to record at least two more, if not four more, between now and next spring release. That'll be uh, released just before that 2025 tour that's going to take place. So, is that the Rock Legends, the XL 2025 tour? Is that that? Should I, should I not know about that? Uh, I'm doing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But is I that the same tour? Or is it a different thing? That that Rock Legends tour is is just a one week cruise. Oh, that's it's a cruise ship. <laughs> it's me and Alice Cooper. I think. Oh, Snakes that's cool. A bunch got it. Of got it. Got it. Yeah. So you're going and doing a whole tour 2025. Yeah. What do you start with? Like, what do you? Like what's, what, what's the first song that you do? It's so important because everybody's ready to hear those first notes. Already gone. And then what do you end with? Hotel. God, for sure. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> um, listen, Don, we're massive fans. Like I said, when I heard you were coming by, and I devoured your book. It was so wonderfully written. And to get perspective of someone who had a career pre, during, and post from what a lot of people know you from is the Eagles, but you have all these different lives and all these different versions. And, you know, musically, you're, you're such a giant. Like for me, it's been super cool to uh, spend a few minutes with you. So we really appreciate it. Oh, so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Eddie, any final question for Don? No, Don, just thank you, and you're awesome. Um, you're awesome. That's our favorite question that's all, to ask. That's all we want to say. Yes, you're Don, awesome. you're awesome. <laughs> yeah, There's dude. no question mark on that one. Um, but we are big fans, and and thanks. And when well, are you when uh, are you announcing the tour? Like, uh, I don't, A lot of people come up to me and say, I grew up with your music. And I said, I did too. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no, no promotion of the tour yet. You don't, you're not saying anything yet? The 2025 tour? Okay. It won't be long. It'd probably be another two weeks, maybe a month before we actually release dates. And we'll have someone send it to me and then we'll, we'll, we'll put, we'll talk about it. We'll promote it for you just Absolutely. for coming in. That'd be great. Fantastic. Right. Uh, thank you very much. That was awesome.